millions of hardware and humans taking aim on the international The furthest distance system. anyone has ever been away from Earth is the crew of the Apollo 13, who were orbiting the far side of the moon during the third moon mission in 1970. At the furthest point, they were more than 400,000 kilometers away from home. For all purposes, they were deep in outer space. Satellites were also in outer space. The closest satellites to Earth are placed in a special orbit just about 200 kilometers above sea level called Low Earth Orbit, or LEO. According to the UCS satellite database, there were about 1500 of these satellites in space in December 2019, and made up almost 70% of all the satellites currently in space right now. Technically, these satellites are still in the Earth's atmosphere. The final traces of the exosphere still linger to almost 10,000 kilometers above the surface, but they are still said to be in space. So where exactly does space begin? At what point can you confidently proclaim that no, you're no longer in the Earth's atmosphere, you are instead in outer space? Well, let's find that out today. Side note, it is super windy today, and don't mind me if my hair keeps flying off during this video. It has been windy for the last couple of days now, and I have no idea how to stop it. The highest distance that anyone has ever jumped from is about 40 kilometers, which is 10,000th of the distance which the Apollo astronauts were from the surface. The record was accomplished by Alan Eustace, who wasn't a daredevil or a stuntsman, he was a computer engineer at Google. On 24th October 2014, Eustace launched himself on a weather balloon from Roswell, New Mexico, the same city famous for its UFO incident. After reaching the stratosphere, Eustace jumped from about 41.425 kilometers in the sky, famously called the edge of space. Regardless of what commonalities claim, according to the World Air Sports Federation, space officially begins at the Kármán line, a distance taken to be exactly 100 kilometers above sea level. All distance below that is the jurisdiction of the country to whom the land belongs. But that isn't always the case. The United States considers space to begin after only 80 kilometers from sea level. Now, the reason why different legal entities are allowed to define space the way that they want to is because of the functioning of the United Nations. Now, the UN as an organization doesn't really have that much power over global politics, but one thing that it does really well is establish common codes of conduct through treaties. Now, it doesn't always have the ability to enforce these treaties, but it still makes the rules very well. Some documents, like the UN Charter or the Geneva Convention, which lays down the laws of war, are essential signings for any country which strives to be a member of the UN. But others, well, not so much. The particular document which deals with the legal status of space is the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, which states that space is common property and is not subject to claims of sovereignty by any one nation. When the Outer Space Treaty was originally penned down in 1966, travel to space was merely becoming plausible and, you know, certainly not commonplace. The treaty itself was hastily put together during the apex of the space race between the United States and the former USSR. It and subsequent other documents agreed upon by the nations of the UN state space as akin to the high seas, or international waters, which are defined under the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea. If this legality is applied to outer space, then it yields a number of effects. Astronauts who commit a crime in space are liable to be prosecuted by their country of citizenship, like Anne McLean, who accidentally broke the law by accessing her partner's bank account on the ISS during a custody lawsuit. Children hypothetically born in space would be given the nationality of the country which owns the vessel they are birthed in, similar to births at sea, which were exceedingly common in pre-modern times, to the point that in calamities such as the Irish potato famine, more than 8,000 children were born in ships and were later designated to their home country of Ireland. A child who would be born in a spacecraft with the flag of Russia would be a Russian. A child born in a spacecraft with the flag of the USA would be American. Space is big, it quite literally contains everything, and that includes wonders and horrors that we as a species have just not been designed to deal with. That's what makes laying down laws and regulations for celestial bodies so futile, because those rules don't apply the same way that they do on Earth. Treaties such as the Outer Space Treaty or the Failed Moon Treaty of 1979 carry with them the flawed belief that humans are not meant for interplanetary colonization, that leaving the surface of the Earth is a novelty but with no real-world use. 
To forget the nature of humans and nations, they attempt to hamper continued progress into the skies by creating strict codes of conduct which make it difficult for us to forge a path into the areas of the universe that we as a species have no control over. The furthest that the crew of the Apollo 13 ever reached is far enough to take you six months to drive by car, but at the cosmic scale, it's merely the blink of an eye. While human beings have never crossed that 380,000 kilometers barrier, unmanned space probes have gone to vast distances and seen alien worlds so far from home that the messages they send to us at the speed of light take half a day to reach. Somewhere billions of kilometers away, heading toward the final edges of the solar system are the only remnants of human technology which have crossed into the border of the Kuiper Belt. A string of millions of asteroid-like bodies called Kuiper Belt objects named after Gerard Kuiper who mathematically predicted their existence in 1951. The most important of them is Pluto, first detected in 1930 by Clyde Tombaugh. Only five man-made objects have ever crossed into this uncharted territory, Pioneer 10 and 11, Voyager 1 and 2, and most recently New Horizons, which made the first flyby of Pluto in July 2015, and sent back the first high-resolution photos of Pluto ever taken. In 2018, it passed by the Kuiper Belt object Aerokoth, and will likely make another flyby of a Kuiper Belt object within the next five years. But the furthest that a man-made probe has ever reached is not New Horizons, but Voyager 1, which is traveling away from Earth at a distance of 152 astronomical units, or almost 23 billion kilometers. To put that distance into perspective, a single astronomical unit is the distance between the Earth and the Sun. Voyager is so far away that the signals it sends at the speed of light take 19 hours to reach us on Earth. To this day, 42 years after its original launch, Voyager 1 still remains the most successful probe that we have ever sent to outer space. But far beyond the reaches of even our most powerful interstellar probes, there are regions in the solar system even further and even more unknown. Only a few of their inhabitants have ever been seen by us, and even then only once every few decades. These are the great comets which reside in the theoretical Oort cloud proposed independently by Ernst Oppik and Jan Oort in the mid-20th century. These bodies take thousands of years to circle the Sun in highly elliptical orbits and form great tails when they approach Earth, the most famous of which are Hale-Bopp and McNaught, the great comets of 1997 and 2007, which had negative apparent magnitudes and stretched across the sky for the better portion of a year. While Hilbop will return another 2500 years, we do not know if McNaught will ever pass by the sun again. It stays in a trajectory headed outward from the solar system towards the galactic center, where it may become merely another example of a rogue comet, one with no star system to guide it. As of now, the Oort cloud is still pretty much a theoretical construction. We don't know if these comets mark the outer edges of the sun's gravity into space, but we do know that there are millions, if not billions, of such objects which follow paths that lead them to distances of thousands of astronomical units away from the Sun. The region may extend to more than two light years in width. For comparison, the furthest non-comet object we know of is Sedna, named after the Inuit goddess of the sea. Sedna's point of closest approach to the Sun is a mere 76 astronomical units, about three times that of Neptune's, and it takes almost 11,000 years to complete its orbit. The comets of the Oort cloud may be so far away that they never see the light of the sun up close. To them, the sun is just another star. This is the edge of the solar system, anything beyond this, and we are constrained to what we can see through telescopes. Through these telescopes, we look back to the past to see what happened hundreds, thousands, and millions of years ago, because the stars are so far that their light cannot travel to us instantaneously. We do not know what they look like right now. The light we receive is that which they have sent to us years ago, because that is the only light which has had the time to reach us. We can no longer use astronomical units to measure length. Instead, we shift our measurements to light years, the distance that an object traveling at light speed would cover in an entire year. Another unit we commonly use is a parsec, defined in terms of an angle. To illustrate what a parsec is, take a star somewhere far away from the Earth. An observer standing on that star when facing the sun would also notice the Earth orbiting around it. If we draw a line from the observer to the sun and from the observer to the Earth, then the two lines would have a small angle between them. When the magnitude of this angle is an arc second or 36,000th of a degree, then we call the distance a parallax second or a parsec. 
While interstellar distances are far too vast for our current technology to conquer, uh, occasionally visitors from the other parts of the galaxy do make their way into the solar system. The latest of these extraterrestrial visitors was Oumuamua, which passed through the inner solar system in late 2017 and was first detected by astronomers at the University of Hawaii. Oumuamua slingshotted past the sun in the September of that year at a speed of 87.3 km per second, but never left an icy tail. Originally classified as a comet, scientists quickly realized that Oumuamua was distinct from the object which orbited the sun. Its origin was from outside the solar system. Oumuamua was one of trillions of rogue intergalactic objects which sometimes find themselves attracted by the pull of a star and make incredible flybys before disappearing back into the cosmos for another day. The manner in which we discover these bodies, be it asteroids, Kuiper belt objects, comets, or other intergalactic bodies, is through observation, through telescopes. Our earliest telescopes dating back to the 1600s were simple systems of lenses which magnified the images of objects as they passed through. For a long time, these were the telescopes through which we saw the rings of Saturn, found the moons of Jupiter, and discovered the outermost planets from the Sun, Uranus, and Neptune. But the technological explosion of the past 50 years has allowed us to create objects the like of which we have never been seen in all of human history, and one of them is telescopes. The most important of them are NASA's three great observatories, the Hubble Space Telescope, the Chandra X-ray Observatory, and the Spitzer Space Telescope. While in 2020 all three of them have crossed the end of their lifespan, the observatories were designed to work together and detect light from all over the electromagnetic spectrum. Using a combination of X-ray, infrared, and visible light, astronomers have been able to recreate some of the most remarkable images ever taken. For millions of years from now, we will probably not remain. The universe is too dangerous, space too full of surprises, and to a species which remains in just a single planet, any small disturbance may put an end to it all. At any moment the solar system may enter into the intense gravitational field of a black hole. A nearby supernova or gamma ray burst may irritate us with lethal radiation. Or the threat could come from closer to home. An asteroid collision, a supervolcano eruption, perhaps even an unstoppable disease could wipe humanity out like the fragile creatures we are. And if none of these events come to pass, we only need to look to Betelgeuse, the star on Orion's right shoulder. In the last stages of its life cycle, Betelgeuse will probably burst into a supernova within the next 10,000 years. It may not affect life on Earth, but it serves as a painful reminder that our own sun is not immune to these eternal processes of star birth and death. Five billion years from now, long after Hale, Bob, and McNaught have shed their icy skins and burned away to nothingness, the sun will expand into a red giant and with it engulf the orbits of Mercury and Venus. Even if catastrophe arrives before that, our satellites will have long fallen back to the surface, our buildings would have rotten and Earth would have returned to its primordial state, with huge oceans perhaps concealing traces of microscopic life. When that time comes, the only bits of humanity still remaining will be the pioneers, the voyagers, and the new horizons floating forever in that endless void, carrying with them small indications that there was once a race that lived in a distant corner of the galaxy, orbiting around a small and insignificant star they called the Sun. It was a race which had the ability to send these probes because of its commitment and desire to explore. Space is unimaginably vast. When Voyager 1 looked back while exiting the outer reaches of the orbit of Neptune, it captured this single image. Christ in pale blue dot, Earth is this tiny, tiny speck floating in the center of a vast solar cloud. In 2020, we celebrated the capture of this wonderful photograph by reprocessing the image to receive sharper detail than ever before. It is fitting, in a way, a coming phase that we revisited the photograph last year, a landmark in our history and a hope for the future through a picture of our sole planet taken by the greatest remnant in the universe that we have ever sent. As Carl Sagan put it, it is the only home we have ever known.
Hello everyone, this video is the first video in a series that is going to be called A Tour of the Universe. Now on this channel I usually post videos about math, but I don't really post about how math is used, and this series is going to be about how math is used, particularly in astronomy and, ast and uh, cosmology. So thank you all for supporting this channel. We have recently hit 6,000 subscribers, which is absolutely awesome, and it's because of you guys. Uh, the next video in this series is going to be coming very soon. It's going to be called A Shape of the Universe, and um, as always, thank you for watching.